Hey everybody, this is Dave Dugdale, LearningDSLRVideo.com, and today we have on the show Jem Schofield from the C47. Um, Jem's got a daily video podcast called Gearbox, and he also has uh, Filmmakers Intensive, which is, I believe, a two-week intensive crash course, and his yep. company is called Buttons Productions, and he's got clients like, or has clients like Apple, New York Times, and Canon. That's kind of also, why I wanted to talk with uh, Jim is because he has this Canon series called the um, Digital Learning Center uh, series up on the Canon site, and it's got about, I don't know, 10 videos or so that are very uh, educational in terms of shooting with the DSLR. So, Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Dave. Thanks for having me. So, I wanted, basically what I want to talk about today is um, kind of a selfish on uh, my part because I wanted to do a... Uh, uh, somewhat of a corporate video, kind of a uh, promo piece for a local photographer. And I haven't okay. picked out who it is, and I'm going to do it totally for free since I have no experience in this whatsoever. So I want to kind of pick your brain because in that um, Canon Digital Learning Center piece that you did, there was uh, you were talking about some corporate videos that you were working on. One was like at a, a distillery, and then there was another one I think you're working at a bed and breakfast. And it was really interesting to hear you even in the background talking to the uh, your clients and how you're interfacing with them. And I was like, man, I need some of that knowledge before I go into this type of yeah. situation. So what I wanted to kind of start off with is when you meet with the client and you go, um, do you meet with the client or do you like go do some sort of pre-production, scout it out kind of thing? What, what are the things you're looking for when you first meet with the client? Yeah, so it always starts with uh, with a meeting, and I'm not a huge meeting person. Meaning, I, I you know I don't believe in meeting after meeting after meeting. But I think that for both sides, that initial contact in person <laughs> is you good. I can <laughs> come over I... there. I, I can go to Colorado and Heimlich you if you need me to. Water I have three went down kids. the wrong pipe. I can do it. <laughs> um, it could happen to me any moment. So uh, that initial connection is really important. And unless you're getting a huge referral from an existing client, then it usually warrants uh, a meeting you know, to begin with. And that meeting serves many purposes. I think that the most important thing that it does for you as a creative person is it allows you to, um, and you should think about it this way, it allows you as well as the client to figure out if there's a good match. You know, are, is, there, is there a synergy there? And is there mutual respect? Is there mutual interest in what both sides are doing? And when I say mutual interest, I don't mean that the client has to be interested in video production or filmmaking. But are they interested in the skill sets that you bring into your creative talent and what you're doing? And are you interested in what it is their product and or service that they're offering? And do you think that they're going to be somebody that you can work with? Um, and I can tell you that, and it's something I've spoken about in the past on my podcast, that you really have to trust your instincts. You really have to think about the long term as opposed to that initial, you know, oh, they're going to write me a check and I can pay some bills. That's never what it's about, um, or at least in my opinion it shouldn't be. Money is always the byproduct of what we do and we should be doing it to make a living we should be doing it to pay our bills we should be doing it to be successful but hopefully we're doing this because we like to be creative and that we like to tell stories and whether it's in a corporate environment or it's in a narrative you know sort of episodic television film environment it's still basically about telling stories and the goal is to uh, get a response and and the response from the audience is they love the movie and they tell everybody else that they love the movie and so more people buy tickets and they go and see the movie and then Hollywood makes money or that studio makes money in a corporate video it's somebody either buys a product uh, they buy a service or they give you know if it's a fundraising so you know it's a it's supposed to elicit response but that initial meeting is so important for both sides and and I would say that you know your biggest thing that you should be looking for when you have that meeting is um, does this feel right you know is this somebody that I can work with and and tell a story about whether it's a company or or an individual that makes sense yeah yeah um actually before we continue let me uh, see if I can shift my video over to the left side because I'm cutting your chin off a little bit 
There. Oh, really? I okay. think that. I think that looks better. <laughs> Hopefully that works. I can't, I can't see what you see. So that's okay. okay. Okay, cool. So let's talk about like the guy in the distillery. Did you actually meet with him beforehand? And did you scout that location? Cause it has a lot of interesting things inside that building, you know? Yep. I mean, it's uh, it's interesting. So I did 20, 21 videos for Canon. Six of them were for their XF series camcorders and 15 were for the EOS HD DSLRs. And all of those locations are fabricated locations. Uh, okay. So in that situation, uh, they're very much along the lines of things that I do for a living in production. And so to just sort of differentiate, I have Buttons Productions is my production company. That's a company I've had since 96. And that's what I do my work through. So if I get hired by a client to produce a video or do something else, that's Buttons Productions. The C47 is really the educational brand. So anything that I do that has to do with learning, training, uh, the craft of video production and filmmaking, that's the C47. But the Canon job was sort of this weird combination of Buttons Productions and the C47 because I was producing real content, but it was educational content specifically for Canon. So, um, so we did scout locations, we did find locations, but it was through people that we knew or people that I knew and my crew knew so we could find all of those places. So, um, so if you go to the XF series, there's this great bike location, this guy who builds bikes in, uh, in an undisclosed location in New Jersey, very close to New York. And that was through one of my crew members. Um, he knew somebody who knew this guy, uh, Kenny, who basically works on all these great bikes. And that became our location for a few days for some of the videos. Upstate New York, um, I worked very closely with a good friend of mine who's a director and an actor named Skip Suddeth. And he knew somebody who owned the Bed and Breakfast, which is Gosselin Pond, which you saw. We wound up crewing, uh, the whole crew stayed at that location last fall for something we were shooting, a narrative project. Um, and then we went back there and we used that as our base to shoot not only the Bed and Breakfast stuff, but also she knew because she is a um, a production designer she knew the people who owned the distillery and the uh, and the dancing cat saloon so we went there and we talked to them and we wound up uh, using that as a location for a lot of stuff but we did it and we did all of the videos in a real world scenario so you know if we were shooting a video for a client would we would we do it this way? And we would. And so the distillery was a perfect example. That would be a travel show, maybe a cooking show, or just a straight travel show where they found this unique location and they did a small piece, maybe a 10-minute piece, on the distillery. And so we shot it in that style. But of course, the education part of it was, why are we using zoom lenses when we shoot this type of project? So in that in that situation, if it was a, a true client, that distillery, I mean, yep. would you have gone there beforehand, or would you just gone in and just run and gun and? Yeah. Um, well, in essence, they did become a real client because we used their location and they were in the video. And while they weren't paying my company financially, the mutual agreement there was that they got promotion because they were going to be on Canon's site and there would be a link to their website. So in essence, I treated them exactly like I would any other client. They had to sign release forms. You know, we scouted the location ahead of time. Um, so the question is a very valid question. We always scout locations if we can, and we scout it for visual and we scout it for uh, audio. You know, as far as sound, potential sound issues. Yeah, and, you, did a, yeah. you did a video recently on your C forty seven, which is really good. You were just like, not just go to the location and listen, but bring a recorder and yeah. just put headphones on and listen to it and you're going to find out a whole bunch of problems that you're going to have to deal with a lot of problems <laughs> and that's so true I, i'm i have an audio background so that definitely rang true for me when you were talking about that it's an easy one to forget it is and you know unless you have the sound person with you it's a, a huge one and if you don't listen to your location then you could look there's always going to be surprises that location when we're in the distillery um there was Fish, the band Fish was coming for uh, Memorial Day, and they were doing a huge concert across the street where Woodstock occurred in Bethel, New York. And we asked them, okay, so you've got this concert coming in, you're building a stage outside of your restaurant and distillery, 
are we going to have any audio problems? And they said, absolutely not. It'll all be built before you show up. And we show up the day of the shoot, and they're building a deck outside of, yeah, bang, bang, bang. Uh, if, you go to the can if you go to Canon site and you go to the Primes video where we talk about using Primes, it's this bar set. And they were building a stage in the set right outside the door. And we had to work around that. And it was, uh, it was like any other production. We had to come up with some agreements with the crew and make sure that we weren't cutting into their work. Um, you can't tell the client to just stop for the day. You just have to solve the problem and come up with solutions. And that's what a producer does. I mean, that's the producer's job is to solve problems. Um, so it all worked out, and we just shifted the times that we shot. Yeah, I know what you mean. I used to uh, um, do acoustical engineering, and I used to, uh, we used to work in large arenas a lot of the time because we were uh, commissioning sound systems that we designed. And right. it was always at the very end of the project and the, you know, the grand opening was just about to happen and we needed to be quiet because we needed to test the sound system. And of course, everybody else is banging and stuff like that. And it's, yeah, it, you have to work with those people or work, work at night, <laughs> which yeah, is really exactly. tough. And, so, and, it's all about, and it's all about preparing and you prepare so that you can deal with the things that will always come up. You don't prepare so that nothing will come up. It's, it's inevitable in production, as you know that you're always going to be thrown curveballs. It's going to be the bird, you know, squawking in the in you know 3 miles away, which happened on the actually on the Canon videos of Gosling Pond, there were ducks, you know, we couldn't see them. We couldn't chase them away. Um, we were shooting at Fulton Ferry Landing and they were doing construction on the Brooklyn Bridge. And then, you know, it was quiet for the entire time that we were setting up and as soon as we rolled camera, they started with the drill you know, uh, a jackhammer. And so it's just the way it's going to be. But if you have everything else in place, then it's much easier to deal with and address those problems, as you know, from your experience. If you don't do all of the prep, all the pre-production, the scouting and having the right equipment and everything else, then you are compounding those problems because you have all of the problems that you didn't prepare for and then all the stuff that's the surprises. And that's the awful stuff. Yeah. And I will recommend all the people that are watching this definitely go and watch the Canon, Canon Digital Learning Center where you put up those videos because I actually watched them again. Um, I didn't watch all of them again, but I watched uh, several of them again, and I got even more information the second time through, especially when you're talking about, which is very true. Um, I, I have more of a run and gun style, so I use zooms. I mean, yeah. there's just no way I'm going to like pre-visualize what I'm going to do with primes. There's just no way. Yeah. Um, so it was really interesting and I think everybody should watch it. Um, and definitely just that, you know, that concept of, you know, what do you bring to the shoot? Um, and then you, you talked about all those different zooms, like the 7200, which I don't own yet. I'd love to own, but it's kind of pricey. Yeah. <laughs> that almost in a way is like a prime in a way. Cause it's always, it's already fast, right? Yeah. It already goes down quite a bit, um, in terms of, the, in terms of light, but, uh, you can do a, a ton of things with it. Do you use that a lot in interviews? Uh, 70, I do. Yeah, I, I don't use the f2.8 very much because it doesn't hold focus the way the f4 does. The f4 actually holds focus better. Oh, really? Um, yeah, but it, and it's lightweight, and you can actually buy the f4 version of that lens without image stabilization for well under $1,000, and the image stabilized version of the f4 is just over $1,000. And that lens lives on my 5D Mark II when I shoot interviews. That is my interview lens. And when you shoot interviews, you generally, um, as far as focal length, uh, sensor size, and aperture, the combination of the three all sort of working together, you don't really want to be shooting interviews unless you're extremely experienced as an operator uh, or you have somebody pulling focus at less than probably about an f5. We usually shoot most of our interviews at an f5.6 to about an f8 because we want people to be able to move. You know, we've got tiny little sensors here and we're shooting with these really wide angle lenses in, in webcams, so we don't have that compression happening as far as optically and we don't have the large sensor and, you know, huge aperture. Um, and, and so we don't have those depth of field issues. And, and the main reason we don't have the depth of field issues with these cameras is because they have incredibly wide lenses. In order to get the same field of view or same you know, angle of view that we would get with a, uh, a lens on a, a full-frame camera or an APS-C camera, 
we we have to use a, a much longer lens, which gives compression, and we get a, a shallower depth of field. But these cameras, they're super wide. You know, they're super super wide, and the world is not compressed on super wide lenses. It's all separated, and so um, so you know, it's not an issue with these small chip cameras. But when we get into our DSLRs, it's it's really hard to shoot an interview with an f two point eight. And so um, that 70 to 200 is like a, a, a magic lens when you're shooting interviews because it allows you to keep enough distance from your subject so that they don't feel uncomfortable. You don't want to have a lens smashed up against somebody's face. But yeah, you that's can what I wanted to lens. ask is how typically how close do you have the camera to them when you're doing well, that kind of typical? Yeah. Is it 10 feet? Is it 6 feet? Is it um, 15 feet? No, it's probably about seven or eight feet, okay. maybe ten feet. You because know, obviously, it, the farther yeah. you go, and if you stop it, if you're going down to like, let's say, a two point eight, if it's yeah. farther away, but that distance of them going in and out becomes less of an issue, right? Well, yeah, it, it all depends. I mean, it's distance is part of the equation, but if you're dealing with a large sensor camera and you want to have a field of view, you want to frame them in a certain way, and let's say that this is the tight shot of my face here, so I'm up here. Um, you know, you, you have to factor in all of the pieces, and all of the pieces are the size of the sensor, um, you know, the focal length that your lens is at, what aperture your camera is set to. Those are the three things that are sort of working in concert to determine um, how deep or how shallow your depth of field is. And and so, really, when you're in a space shooting interviews, the real key is what do you instinctually feel is comfortable for the client. And you never want to have a camera, like, look at your microphone placement. Can you imagine if the camera was as close to the subject as your mic was? And they would just feel uncomfortable. They would feel like they were being interrogated. As it is, when you have the mic above them, that's pretty close. But it's out of their sort of view when they're looking at the interviewer. So they forget about the microphone. But the camera has to be about eye level or just slightly above to give you sort of, you know, um, that sort of correct view, uh, the correct eye level, and and so they're going to be looking at the lens. It's hard enough to get them to not look at the camera. You know, you're, they're being interviewed and they're looking at the person, and then all of a sudden they keep darting over to the camera when they're thinking. And that's part of what you have to do as the interviewer is to give them sort of some guidelines so that they don't do that. Because unless they're looking straight to camera, like you do in a podcast. It looks weird when they keep darting their eyes and look at the camera. So you have to kind of let them know that, but in a way that just sort of makes it okay for them. Um, yeah. So let's talk about lighting next. Um, what in those situations like the distillery or the bed and breakfast? I mean, you know, without let's say you're going into that situation without scouting it, what are you going to bring with you in terms of lighting? What's your go-to lighting type setup for an interview? Um, well, you know, when we're talking about daylight then it's really about having two things. It's about having reflectors and it's about having diffusion. Those are the two things that we're looking for outside. And those are our quote unquote lights because we don't really have the ability unless we're taking huge HMIs um, to fight mother nature. So what we have to do is we have to harness mother nature and say we've got this huge hard light source that is actually a relatively small hard light source if you look at it coming from the sky and unless it's a cloudy day you have to do things to um, get the look that you want and diffusion is one way to do that what we used in the uh, Canon videos is we used two different types of uh, silks we used a 6x6 made by Lasto Light, which pretty much anybody can afford and it's basically a aluminum sort of memory um, frame, it kind of looks like those camping things, and you just stretch your diffusion over that, or a reflector. So it's a big six by six, and if you put that up on a couple of big C stands, and you put a lot of sandbags down there, then even if you're shooting at noon, you can get some nice diffusion, and you just have to position the person so that you're either using the sun as a rim or a backlight, or you are, you know, diffusing the sun as it comes into the person with a big silk, you know, here I am and there's your big silk, and then I'm using reflectors to create fill um, and things like that. So I'd say outside, you know, it's definitely having lots of reflectors, usually the collapsible kind that everybody knows about. You've got one behind you, 
over your left shoulder. You can see um, that. Yeah, exactly. You know, so that type of thing. Um, and a lot of those are what we call five by ones uh, or five in ones. And in the center of the reflector is a diffuser. It's usually not big enough for much more than sort of, you know, from here to here if you have somebody there. But if uh, you use a six by six, then you can do that. There you go. So that's probably, is that a, so there's your gold, and then you sometimes have a gold silver, and then in the middle, that is that a five by is that a five and one? So you yeah. have a you have a diffuser in the center. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's just much larger versions of those that are rectangular or that are square. When we did the thing on the uh, filters, what we did is we uh, had an eight by eight, which had a much bigger frame, so eight foot by eight foot. And then in feature films, they fly silks that are twelve by twelve and sometimes twenty by twenty. So 20 feet by 20 feet because they have actors walking on and off a certain space and they want to make sure that everybody has a nice diffuse, beautiful light, you know, and they have to shoot it at all times of day. So I'd say that outside, that's the deal. Inside, when it comes to typical interviews, normally I'm either using LED or fluorescent fixtures. If I'm shooting with fluorescence, it's usually one KinoFlow Diva light and a reflector for fill one like you have right there. Usually we're using the white or the silver side of that. There's usually one little light. It could be a little LED or a little pro light or a little Airy 150, and that's being used as the rim or the hair light. I have no hair, so I can't call it a hair light, but you could. You could get away with that. <laughs> and then um, and then usually that's your three-point lighting. So it's let's say uh, we've got a uh, basically a fluorescent fixture. We've got a fill and then I'm obviously wrong direction if I'm talking about, you know, there's my key light, but we've got a fluorescent, we've got a fill, and then you've got the little rim or hair light, and then usually we have some sort of background light as well, which could also be just a small fixture, usually a focusable hard light source, so like an Airy 150, a Pro Light, a Dato, uh, uh, Dato light, or maybe an LTM Pepper, so small, you know, 100 to 300 watt, just to throw a little bit of light on the background and, and do some stuff like that. But you can definitely get away with just two lights for almost any interview. The real trick there is then how do you create more separation with the background with more than just the rim or the uh, hair light? That's with a background light, and that's having that you know that other light. Uh, almost never use uh, a light for the fill. It's almost always a reflector in my case. Okay. Yeah. 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 Is that? Yeah. Yeah. You can ask me more about that. Um. Actually, like, the, on the uh, <clears throat> the day of the shoot, how many? How many people do you have on the actual shoot? Is it you're just yourself doing it all kind of thing, or yeah, do, do typically a it's a typically a shoot is at least three people usually, because usually um, and I've done plenty of stuff all by myself, but it's not fun and it takes four times as long. But usually there's at least you know let's say it's a typical interview type of setup. It's a three man crew, so we usually have one person. Uh, myself, who would still be a crew member helping set up and break down the equipment. Um, but I would also be the producer of the project. I would generally be the one interviewing the client. That's not always the case, but in my situation it is. I'm comfortable doing that. So I'm usually the interviewer. Um, there's usually a camera operator, and then there's usually somebody else who we sometimes refer to as a swing, who is both a you know so a, a, a grip and a gaffer. They're sort of doing lighting and they're also setting up equipment. Um, they may be monitoring audio. You know, they may be doing those types of things. But it's I would say that for a typical standard interview setup, it would be best if you had a crew of three people because it sort of makes things fit together the right way. Um, some of the other work that I've done, I've had crews up to 10, 12 people, depending on the size of the project and how many things we are trying to you know, deal with in a day. If we're shooting in three or four different locations, even though it's, you know, the proximity is similar, then you need to have more hands. You need to move equipment. There's a company move, so you have to go from one place to another. You need to have hair and makeup. You need to have a dedicated sound recordist who's really you know, paying attention to that. And usually we have at least two cameras. And in fact, most of the time when I do interview style setups, we're also using two cameras for that. So that three-person crew becomes really critical because you've basically got your A camera operator, who's usually the DP as well, the director of photography. You have your B camera operator, that other crew member. And then you have you know, the person conducting the interviews. 
And so if you want to have that sort of, you know, wider shot and then you want to have that tighter shot and you want to be able to cut between those two, you've got to have two cameras. And then I may be the one monitoring audio and also conducting the interviews. So three seems to be a, a, a minimum magic number. So let's say, all right, you're all set. You got the client there, the lighting set, the sound's ready to go. <clears throat> the client sits down or standing up. How do you get them to relax? How do you get them to, you know, you know, get them to basically yeah. just relax? Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, it's something that I teach in in my workshops, and it's something that we actually drill and we do stuff with when we're talking about conducting interviews. And I've been toying with the idea of actually doing a, a training series specifically on lighting, shooting, and conducting interviews. Um, first of all, the number one thing is the person interviewing the people has to want to and be interested in talking to people. That's the first thing. So the interest has to be there. If you have somebody sitting in the chair who just wants to get through the questions, then they're not the right person to conduct the interviews. You have to be genuinely interested in people and, and who, who different people are. Just almost a fascination with the character of people um, and their stories. The second thing is that when they walk into the space, a good percentage of those people have never been interviewed before. They've never been in front of cameras and lights the way that you would see in a press junket for a feature film or something like that. So there's a, an immediately a connection that that's what they're seeing because they might think they're going to walk into a room with just a camera. Um, and so they're a little surprised and you have to basically introduce yourself, you have them sit down and just let them know that first of all, they're just going to have a conversation. So, you know, usually clients like to send out questions to their employees or people that have very specific questions and, and a good percentage of people who show up will have answers prepared. You know, they'll have practice in front of a mirror that whole night before or that morning or in their hotel room or whatever it is. And the first thing you do, the first thing I do at least, everybody's very different, is I say, you know those questions that you received? I probably won't even ask you those questions. Yeah. Or I'm not even going to ask them in that order. And so immediately You've what heard, you do, yeah, you break their circuit. Okay. Yeah, because I've done that where I've done interviews with people and it, I had this set of questions. They had a set of questions that were identical. And we worked through the questions and it came out really stale. Yeah. Not. I, I don't believe in that. I think that... If you're the person interviewing, you have to have the confidence that you know what the story is that's trying to be told. Now, obviously, documentary filmmaking is a little different, but what most of us do is more documentary style. So we're conducting an interview, but the end result is going to be a video that raises money for something, that sells a product or a service. So there's a story that has to be told. There's messaging. There's something that has to support the brand. There's some, something that has to support the branding efforts uh, and the marketing efforts of that company. And so when you sit down to conduct that interview, if you have the confidence that you know what the, the story is that you're trying to have told, then you don't have to ask those questions the way they're written down on a piece of paper. And what you'll do is you'll break the circuit of the person you're interviewing eventually. Now, there's always a small percentage of people that you won't be able to get through. They just It's just not going to happen. And you have to recognize that early on and just get through a couple of questions and then move on to the next person. But most of the people, if you sit down with them and you just blow that circuit, you know, that they think, oh, I have to answer it a certain way and I have to do this and practice, then they'll start to just have a conversation with you. You also have to have the confidence that um, what you're listening to, if you're going to either edit it or you're going to have somebody else edit it, you have to know that the pieces of your story are in there, even if the person flubs or makes a mistake. Um, because a lot of people will tend to feel like they have to have a complete short answer whenever they ask a question to somebody. And you don't, because if you look, you'll find little pieces in what they're saying, and you'll say, that's a magic moment, that's a moment there. You're editing in your head as you're conducting the interview, and you know that those pieces are there to tell the story. And that's the jigsaw puzzle that you have to put together in post. So let's say you, there's one part of the story you really want to be told well, and let's say they they don't answer the question very well that yep. of, of to your liking. Um, in fact, one of my um, acquaintances uh, actually got interviewed on Oprah a while back, and he, the team of Oprah descended on him. You know, wasn't Oprah himself just to get interviewed. And they were just pounding them, pounding them until they got the answer that they wanted. 
Yeah. Um, is that something that needs to be done, or I mean, how do you, how do you? Go? Yeah, I don't. I, well, first of all, I don't believe in. It may be different in a you know in a Mori Povich situation or something <laughs> like that. Uh, but my whole job as a producer is to make my talent feel comfortable. And, and I want them to feel comfortable because I want them to tell great stories. I want them to have a conversation with me and find those bits. So um, it's always about asking the question in a different way. It's okay. about re-asking it, but not saying, can you say it exactly this way? It's a little different when you're working with children. Sometimes you have to have them almost give you a sound bite. You know, repeat what they said, but in a much shorter period of time and just get the message there. But even that is a little bit uh, fabricated. So for me, it's it's about the person feeling natural. I always have a lead-in question. I might ask them something about when they were a kid, or you know, a great memory about something that may or may not be related to what the interview is about. Okay. And it's just starting to get them to get comfortable. It's telling them that you know, uh, you know, you can always look away to think about something, but always talk to me. Don't look at the camera because it'll look weird later on. And you know, we have we sort of have a little lead in there. And once they're in, once they're having a conversation with you, then you can just have a conversation. So, you know, I could say to you, Dave, tell me a little bit about, you know, why you love fly fishing. And you're like, well, you know, when I was a kid, my dad was um, just really a great guy and we spent a lot of time together. So what was it about fly fishing with your dad that you really enjoyed? Well, I love fly fishing with my dad because, you know, we would go out to the river and he would tell me how to do this. And it's just continuing the conversation. So you are, as the interviewer, starting to get that person to talk more about that subject. And you'll get those pieces. Because you didn't answer the question in my scenario where I was having a conversation with myself just there in the first question that I asked. But then when I asked you a follow-up question, then you started to you know, talk about that whole thing. Okay. And so, so um, you're actually going to the interview well prepared on how to reiterate on questions to, to pull out the story from them. Kind of yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and, I, and prepared means that you're just willing to talk to people. Yeah. It's not necessarily that you have five variations of your question. Okay. You know that when we have a, a conversation, that if you're not getting an answer to the question that you've asked me, you're going to ask it to me in a slightly different way. You're going to ask me the same question, maybe almost in the same way, but with a different uh, tone or a different way of presenting it. And so those things are, um, I'm going to see if I can... It's like I'm a little. That's eh, all right. Cool. You're good. Um, you 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 just you know you just talk to people. It's just instinct. So let's say you've got somebody and you're you've gone through those different methods and the guy the guy is just like a piece of cardboard. He's not given much. You know. Yeah. How do you get some? How do you? Because how do you get them to be more not animated but more passionate about it? Because like, I remember that one. I could hear you off camera to the distillery guy. You're like, what makes you passionate about you know such and such? Yeah, I mean, is that, those are the type of questions you have to ask to get them to be, to give you less of a cardboard answer. Yeah, I mean that one was a little tricky too because he was um, he was sort of bouncing around a lot and he sort of rocked a lot when he spoke, and um, and so it was just having enough time with the person. He was our only choice in that situation, so we sort of had to make it work. When I'm interviewing thirty people over a two or three day period then I might not get what I need out of one person, so I'll get it out of somebody else, meaning the, the, you know, the, the story. Or there's a thread. You start to interview people and you start to hear more than one person say something that wasn't even in your questioning, but you realize this could be the thread of, of the piece. And so you start to ask new questions to all the people who come after that to continue that thread. So it's about not being a robot. It's about trying to get the people who are in front of you not to be a robot. It's asking the questions out of order, and it's just doing your best to have a conversation. But like I said, there is that tiny percentage of people that you won't be able to get through to. Um, it's it's rare, but I would say that it's you know it's probably about a a five to ten percent of the people. Yeah. So maybe one out of every ten people you just can't get through to, and then that's where your hat as a producer kicks in. And you have to go to the client and say, is there anybody else in the organization that we could interview? Is there anybody else that we talked to? It's a problem solving situation. You know, if you can't get the CEO to get the messaging to where you want it to be, and they're very, you know, certain about, you know, what they're willing to do and what they're willing to not do, 
then you may have to go get the vice president or somebody else to get that message across. Because in the end, all you're trying to do, besides tell a good story, is you're trying to deliver the product that you promised to your client. And if that means that you have to get a different executive to do that so that the messaging is right, so that it has the impact that you need it to have, then you kind of have to cast aside the whole vanity issue with the CEO and know in your gut that what you're doing is the best thing for the project. You know, and then if they insist that you use a CEO and he's wooden and it's you know and it's cold and whatever it is, then you've you've given the client as much opportunity to get it right as you can, and they're making that decision that they're going to have a video that's going to have less impact. So yeah. So those are pretty much all the questions I had in terms of the corporate video shoot interview kind of thing. And I, I okay. Was kind of curious about. Uh, I don't know if you've got one or not, but I know you're starting to write some articles on the C300. You're, I yeah. think you did a log, log something. Log like, gamma, yeah, yeah. type of thing. Do you I actually... don't have one. Oh, okay. I, I wish I did. <laughs> I've seen that. I've seen and held and operated the camera a little bit. Uh, I had a briefing before I wrote the articles, and uh, not long before the camera actually was released. And so I'm excited to actually spend time shooting some real projects with it. It's definitely an exciting camera. Yeah, yeah I mean, for me and probably my audience, it's way out of m my budget. And, you know, the thing that I'm kind of looking for in the future is, you know, I love I love my Canon T2i. It's yeah. for the price. It's just amazing. And I'm actually uh, also got uh, this is the um, a 77. Yeah. 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 Which I shot with up in uh, in Canada. I did a bunch of stuff with that for my podcasting thing. So, yeah. So what I'm looking for in the next iteration if there's a, a mark three or something the one of the things that i you know i love the look and everything but the one thing i really let me back up a second you know yeah way way before i got the camera i you know i was heard from like somebody like philip bloom saying you know i hate the more i hate the aliasing and and when i got the camera i was like what are you talking about this thing's great well after like i don't know maybe three or four months or six months i'm and then you get those situations you got a lot of horizontal lines and you see all this crap going on and and you're like, oh, yeah. now I know what he's talking about. You know, you, you, I had to experience it myself. And and there's so many shots that have been ruined because of that, you know. And you sometimes you can change your distance. You can change the the whole bunch of stuff. But when you're doing run and gun, and sometimes you just can't see that, those Mori patterns or stuff happen on the screen. So the ho I'm kind of hoping in the next iteration that they'll do something to get around the line skipping issue to get rid of that or be able to output something that's more of a full full yeah. signal. And that isn't line skipping. Well, the 1DX, I just did a presentation up at the Boston Super Meet a couple of weeks ago. I went up there to do a presentation on the 1DX. And the 1DX, at least as far as Canon is concerned, is definitely a camera that's starting to address those issues. It's really the first, uh, you know, version 2 DSLR with video camera that they have. And it's very clearly their high-end flagship stills camera that has video capabilities but they have re-engineered the video capabilities inside the camera to uh, reduce, greatly reduce the moray issues and their processing internally is different so it's not the same exact line skipping method that's being used to my understanding that the uh, 5D Mark II all the way down to the T2 series, T3 series are using, you know, the Rebels. Um, so I think that we'll see a vast improvement in terms of that. And to be honest with you, even with a C300, um, I don't know if I'm necessarily going to go single system sound on most of the stuff that I do, because a lot of the things that I do are multi-camera, at least two cameras, sometimes three. So it makes more sense to have a sound recordist who is recording production audio. Um, you can go right to the camera, and they can have a mixer, and they could be mixing you know, as they're going into the camera. But I actually feel more comfortable as a producer having my audio recorded separately. So um, you know we're not we're not going to see an XLR input probably in the DSLR camera anytime soon. But I do think that we will see huge improvements, starting with the One DX, and hopefully other companies will follow suit to get rid of the problems that we're dealing with. Um, you know, with that first generation, the second generation should handle that. And as you know from the announcement with the C three hundred. Canon is working on a new sort of flagship DSLR form factor camera that's more cinema focused, uh, less stills focused. So that's a new, you know, 4K based camera 
that will hopefully come out within the next 12 months. And I'm sure that whatever follows for the next Rebel camera and the next 60D follow and the next 5D follow, you know, all those things are going to take this, this new sort of stuff and also the compression options. You know, the 1DX has much better options as far as compression over the current crop of DSLRs. So we should be able to see a more editable, friendly format coming out of the camera. Uh, where every frame of video is a full frame of video and, and a bunch of other stuff. So I think, you know, we're we're definitely evolving. It's just the C300 and, and the DSLRs are very different types of camera systems. But the one thing that they are the same in is that they can both produce really beautiful pictures. You know, yeah. they're both there. And you did a really nice piece, uh, I think, last week on the 60D. And you were saying, you know, just get a 60D and get these two lenses and, you know, yeah all the you know if you're if and, and, and i'm kind of in that boat where um because when i graduated to the t2i before i had a, just a regular camcorder a hd yeah. camcorder and there was things i you know i used it for many years and i felt like i got as much out of it as i could and I, there was things i just couldn't do from depth of field to all this other stuff and that's why i graduated but t2i i've had for a couple of years now and i still feel like there's more i need to learn before i can go to the next step you know even yeah. if i go to a like a the Mark III, let's say the 5D Mark III, whenever it comes out, and it, you know, I don't know if that price range of going up to a you know a like three thousand dollar camera, or whatever it's going to be, yeah. if I've got the skills yet to to make that jump. Um, but I really liked your your video you did on the 60D and talking about get these two lenses of 60D and you can create so many amazing things with it. It, it, I mean, it's a great camera system. By the way, I think you do have the skills to probably go to a 5D Mark II, but that's just my opinion. But uh, <laughs> well, it's, but it's, act, it's yeah. actually interesting because I had the the 5D for a month. Um, B and H let me borrow it, and I did a review on it. Um, and it is it is a very nice camera, but in terms of the quality difference in a really well lit situation, there is not much difference between. No, them. there is not. No, no question about it. I mean, all you're getting there is you're getting the full frame sensor. Yeah. And the full frame sensor is giving you a different field of view at the same focal length. Yeah. I mean, that's the big difference is what you're getting. So, um, but I think gen the second generation will be interesting to you, you know, as time goes on. I mean, I think by, you know, the middle of next year, we should see other camera systems. And you obviously have an investment in lenses. So you're looking to Canon at this point as, as a potential solution to the next sort of step for you. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of people. And you know, in the end, this is something I've been talking about for a long time. All of these camera systems are different form factors that have different application. And people don't have to go buy a C300. It's a good fit for me as an educator and as a producer to own a camera like that. Is it the right camera for me? When it comes out, I'll have to make that decision. Um, I think that the F3 is a fantastic camera. I think that the FS100 and the AF100, you know, Sony and Panasonic respectively, are also amazing cameras that give you a lot of the things that people are looking for in a larger sensor camera but in a more video camcorder style body. And those floated around $5,000. They both have pluses and minuses. Neither of them are the perfect camera. Neither is the F3. Neither is the C300. And neither are the RED cameras. You know, they all have pluses and minuses. What I think is really interesting that's just starting to happen now, and I don't, I, I kind of feel a little bit, and I don't know if my audience feels it or, but some of these people like Philip Bloom or some of these people that are going from like a DSLR and going to, a, you know, they're owning a red or something, right. you know, in that $20,000 range. Um, and I, I made this comment on your, uh, one of your um, posts recently that I wonder if there's going to be kind of a, a you know, all these people that, came on with like Philip Bloom and Vincent Lafre and they're like, this is awesome. We, I can buy a T2i and do all these amazing things with it. And I'm, I'm coming along with you for the ride cause you're showing us how to do it. Um, and then all of a sudden they leave us and they go to, you know, a $20,000 camera, which we can't afford. Right. I wonder if they're going to lose some of their audience because of that. And they're going to be like, Hey, wait a minute. We're back down here at the thousand, $2,000 level. We can't go right. to 20,000. Um, I wonder if, a lot of people are going to be felt like they're left behind in a way. I think it depends on who the person is um, and, and what their goal is long term. I mean, I think that both of those guys, they come from very different backgrounds. I mean, Philip comes from a broadcast background. So he was shooting with large, uh, you know, camcorders for a long time, shoulder mount, electronic news gathering style camcorders for news and things. 
And, uh, and, and, and oddly, even though they come from different backgrounds, Vincent came from a journalist bank background, but from stills. Um, both of them have evolved into, you know, into director DP positions, and both of them have been on for the ride for a long time. Philip really got in pretty early on with, uh, with 35 millimeter lens adapters, and Vincent really came on to the scene when the 5D Mark II came out, and he convinced Cam, uh, Canon to let him have the camera and shoot, you know, that the famous video that sort of, you know, started it all. Um, but the but the interesting thing is, you know, where do where do people fit long term in the educational space? My viewpoint is that the C forty seven is focused on really one thing, and that's teaching the craft of video production and filmmaking. So if I'm teaching the craft, if somebody comes in with a sixty D or they come in with a C three hundred or they come in with uh they won't, but if they come in with an F sixty five uh, then the principles, the you know the the concepts, the ideas, the practical knowledge is the same as long as you have an interchangeable lens system, large sensor camera. You know those those things are equalized there. More more problems and line skipping crap and Jello vision and all of that in the one thousand dollar camera than you're going to get in an Arri Alexa, but you can produce images that are similar with both camera systems especially as you said if it's well lit and you know you're spending the time to do those things so um, I think it has to do with focus and you know to me um, you can't say that somebody can't talk about a, a sixty thousand dollar or twenty thousand dollar or one thousand dollar camera they're also growing creatively and they're doing those things and a percentage of those people will move up and some of them will stay with a camera system that's you know in a certain tier for forever um, but I think that I, well, I know that from the workshops that I teach and the things that I do, that there are a lot of really fantastic still photographers who are moving into video production and filmmaking who will use DSLRs as a form factor for certain things, but they will rent or own other camera systems as they go on. If they learn the craft, if they understand how the camera system works, if you come to a workshop and you know, know how to operate a T3i or a 60D or a 7D or a 5D Mark II inside and out, then guess what? You might have to find where the things are in the menu, but you can operate an Arri Alexa. You can operate an F3. You can operate a C300. The basic concepts of ISO, aperture, shutter speed or shutter angle and all of those things, they're the same for the most part in all of those camera systems. So it's now a form factor. It's you know picking that camera because it's the right camera for the job that you're doing because it will reduce the problems that you and I are running into with DSLR cameras and the client's paying you more money and you can rent it and have a larger crew to do that for that one job. But if you really know your camera system and you understand the basic principles of lighting and, and you know camera movement, there's no reason why you can't use all of these cameras when you need to use them. And I think that's the thing that everybody needs to remember is they don't need to own all of these cameras, but if they're really interested in telling stories, they need to know how to use the camera that they have really, really well. And small chip cameras just don't give you the selective focus, the creative options that you would get, that you would um, you know, be able to get if you had a larger sensor camera. And so you know, 60D, if somebody comes to a workshop two years from now, and everybody in the workshop owns video camcorders with large sensors and somebody walks in with a 60D, the person with the 60D is going to be able to produce basically the same stuff that the other people are going to be able to produce. So, um, yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time. Where can, uh, <clears throat> I know you've got lots of stuff all over the web. Where, where can people find you? Um, well, I think, you know, educationally, the best thing to do is to just go to the C47.com because that has a section where it says, you know, what we're doing up, if you're looking at my shoulder and it's up there, I, I don't know if I'm going the right direction. What we're <laughs> doing is basically all of the workshops and, you know, and trade shows and conferences that I'm involved with. So what I'm doing live learning, uh, there's also a link on the C47 to the filmmakers intensive, which is a two week narrative program that you mentioned earlier on. And uh, there's also links to the Canon instructional video. So yeah. I don't usually post my clients' corporate stuff there, but I definitely have links to all the, the key stuff there. Yeah, what were you going to say? Sorry, Dave. 
I highly recommend everybody go over to the Canon site and watch that because that was very good. In fact, I, I like I said before, I watched it twice and I got even more out of it. So thank you very much for doing that. Yeah, and I mean, thank you also because I think that um, while our our backgrounds are slightly different, I think that what you're doing on learning DSLR is uh, is has parallels to what I've been doing for the last two and a half years with Gearbox, which is that. Um, you know, I primarily consider myself a producer and an educator, and I've had a lot of production experience. But when I started Gearbox two and a half years ago, I wasn't setting up a camera and lights every single day. You know, I wasn't shooting with these cameras all of the time. And I had produced uh, a pretty sizable project for a client with the 5D Mark II and had been shooting with 35 millimeter lens adapters for a long time. But, um, but I think that both of us have basically said, we're going to share what we are learning as we're doing this, and um, and I I could probably speak for you and say that you probably can't believe how much you've learned oh, just yeah. by doing it's, this site. It's incredible. The feedback I get is just awesome. You know, yeah. the com you know, even the comments on YouTube are, have been really good. They started off kind of odd, but they've actually gotten better, which is really interesting. And Vimeo has been great. My website, I get a lot of great feedback. And one of the things that's really interesting, and I think you probably noticed this too, is you know, not always sharing, but and you do more than I do because you do almost one a day, which is insane. I do maybe one or twice a week. I do one a video, but when you do it, each time I'm kind of testing something. I might not yeah. say it in the video. It might be a rendering type thing. It might be a lighting type thing. It might be a picture style thing. I might not even tell you, but every time you make something and you're making one one a day, you're right. learning something every time. Like yesterday every I was day. at a CU football game. And one of the things I learned, I shot a ton of video and a ton of stills with my T2i, and it was it was they came they came out awesome. Um, but one of the things I learned was really because I have Magic Lantern on it as well, and 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 yeah. choosing just fine tuning the color temperature, um, especially in because we were in the on the shady side of the stadium, and I was shooting like my family and some of the crowd audience uh, reactions to the game and stuff like that, and spliced it in. And the video came out really really pretty cool actually yeah and I, I can't publicly show it because the nf or not the nfl but the uh whatever the college uh, uh that ticket you buy says you cannot use this yeah you know the, all that stuff but uh, it's but every time you do it you learn something and like that yesterday i was learning about color temperature and how you do really fine tune it for the skin tones you know even in the shade just getting it you know warming it up just slightly because yep. um, if you let the camera try to do it on its own, even in that situation where automatic white balance, you might not get the skin tones you want. And you say, oh, I'll fix it in post. But gosh, it's awfully tough to fix in post sometimes. It is. It's a, and, and, and of course, if something walks in front of the frame that's a different color, the camera tries to white balance for that. Um, you know, they always say, there's a saying that if you want to learn how to be a writer, write. And that concept holds true for any discipline. And I can say that if you're interested in filmmaking and telling stories, just do it. It doesn't mean go make a film, but just set up the camera. I mean, the greatest thing about doing a daily video podcast is, like you said, every single day I learn something new and I make corrections. And I don't acknowledge all of those things all of the time, but they are, they are part of my learning process. And the thing that I love is I love to teach. So every single time I learn something new, last week I was actually talking to Andy Shipsides from Able Cine, and we had a whole conversation about center size and focal lengths of lenses and things like that. And I realized, you know, there's things that I've been teaching that I could teach in a better way. I could adjust the way I explain those concepts because my job is always to take something that's a seemingly very complicated subject and try to make it understandable and also make people feel like they can ask questions and feel comfortable you know, asking so that they can learn. And, um, and it was great because I realized that I could now teach that in a, a much better way so that people would be even better at their craft. And so um, that's why I love doing this. I love doing this because it's the one thing that I found in my life that there's a zero stop learning situation. It's just every single time, you know, you do it, you learn something new. Which is and, awesome. And the audience definitely will let you know because I, I did a video a couple last week and I sped up some of the stuff and I kept the audio in there. So I, you know, because it was getting kind of boring for me because I was doing yeah. a lot of testing and I was like, 
I sped it up and oh boy, people didn't like that at all. Oh, I know. <laughs> so you, you definitely learn from the comments. It's 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 pretty cool. And uh, one of the things I wanted, one more little quick question. Yeah. You're you're a blip guy, and I I I've have blip count going back from oh back when they first started blip yeah. TV. Yeah. I'm kind of curious why why blip. I mean the quality is great and all, but the distribution and the audience. Do you have? Can you get an audience there? Or? Well, it's a good question. Um, you know, my goal with the C47, and by the way, what you see with Gearbox is really sort of like part one. You know, I, I, I since I started it two and a half years ago, the goal was not to do a daily video podcast and that's it. So part two is coming very soon, hopefully by spring of next year, which is really a much bigger educational sort of content creation engine. Um, but I always felt, A, that the site wasn't about advertising. So I, I made a very conscious decision there'd be no banner ads. It would be okay to have equipment sponsors and sponsors for the site, but I didn't want that this particular site to be that. I have no problem with sites being that, but that was sort of the idea with the C47. Um, and I chose Blip because Blip gave me complete control over how my videos were um, transcoded and then uploaded. They never touched a thing at all. And so I could create my Flash version I could create my M4V version for the iPhone and the iPad, and now that's actually changed. They've changed their whole model, and I've just sort of had to swallow the pill and go with it. But the advantage is that now I upload a 720p version every day that I do compress, they do recompress, but the quality is there enough for me, and when they recompress it, it takes a little longer but the end result is that it plays on an Android, it plays on an iPhone, it plays on pretty much everything. They do actually have pretty good distribution. They aggregate to certain sites, right. um, like to iTunes, so I'm in the podcast directory. But I, I can only do, if I'm going to do one video podcast every day and I'm the only person doing it, I wanted one centralized location that people went to, and that's the c47.com. So Blip just became a web, uh, I mean a video hosting service not a destination as opposed to setting up a YouTube channel which I may or may not do in the future I have one I have the C47 on YouTube I have the C47 on Vimeo I have a Twitter account for the C47 that people keep signing up for but <laughs> I, I do a post like once a year but um, but I, I felt like if I could if I can pull this off I have to do it in one place to start with and so eventually if I can spend more time on the C47 than what I'm doing and it's more regular and I do have some stuff planned for that then maybe I will start to um, push that content to other places well very cool thank you very yeah. much thank you Dave and uh, thanks for having me I'm glad we finally got to connect and do this and uh, hopefully we'll do it some more in the future maybe when some new cameras come out or you have some more questions about things and